Chapter 7 A slack-jawed Jackson looked at the men surrounding him. He gathered his wits, squinting against the flashlights they were shining in his face. Can I help you folks? Put the girl down. Put the girl down, one of the men commanded in an authoritative voice. I would like to see some identification first. Jackson talked calmly. He didn't want whatever was happening here to escalate. Amazingly, Katie was still sleeping. His mother had once commented that Katie could sleep through a tornado. I said, put the girl down, the man commanded again, as another man pulled out a badge. Her name is Katie. Jackson carefully bent to set Katie on the ground. As he did, he gave her a hard pinch, hoping she would wake up. What? Katie flinched, blinking at the lights. Everything is okay, ma'am, one of the police officers assured her. Step away from the girl and put your hands on your head, another officer instructed. Do you have any weapons on you? No, sir, Jackson complied slowly and carefully. He didn't want anything to happen to Katie or himself. A cop came up behind him, snapping a handcuff around his wrist, then yanking both arms down so that he could get the other wrist. What is going on? Katie cried, alarmed. Jackson! Ma'am, do you know this man? One of the cops was crouching beside her on the ground. Katie scrambled to her feet. I don't know what you people think is going on, but you have it all wrong. We didn't do anything. Ma'am, no one is accusing you of doing anything. The cop took her by the elbow. Why don't you come over here and we can discuss things? A cop patted Jackson down while another shone his flashlight directly in Jackson's face. Name? Jackson Davis, Jackson supplied. Can I ask what's going on here? The cop pulled out Jackson's wallet and had a look at his driver's license. Where do you live? Pendle, Jackson answered. He was starting to get a little annoyed, but didn't show it. It wouldn't help his case if he showed his temper. He's my friend, Katie's voice floated over to him. I've lived beside him for most of my life. What is your relationship to the young lady? The cop was annoyed that Katie's outraged voice had carried over to them. He grabbed Jackson by the arm, pulling him over to an unmarked police car. She's a friend. We were traveling together to go to a book tour, Jackson explained. It was getting late and I was tired of driving, so I booked two motel rooms. Why didn't she go into the motel office with you? The officer asked. She was asleep. Jackson took a deep breath, reminding himself not to get angry. It would only aggravate matters if he got lippy with the police. I'm sure she can tell you that. Is the truck yours? He continued his barrage of questions. Yes, sir, responded Jackson. Where's the book tour? The officer inquired. Jackson gave him the address. What is the book tour about? He asked. It's for J.D. Emerson, Jackson replied. Who is J.D. Emerson? She's a romance author, sighed Jackson. It's her tour. She talks about her books, signs them, and answers some questions. You're into romance books? The officer gave Jackson an odd look. This was about to become humiliating, Jackson decided. I write the J.D. Emerson romance books. Katie is the face of J.D. Emerson. Everyone is going to think that she writes them. This is our first book tour. Really? The cop's tone indicated his disbelief and concern over Jackson's mental state. Do you have any proof of this? The manuscripts are saved on my computer, Jackson said flatly. Do I need a lawyer? Please get into the car, Mr. Davis. The cop opened the back door. Gritting his teeth, Jackson folded his frame into the back of the cop car. It was very uncomfortable as there was hardly any leg room. As the door shut, he could see Katie arguing with one of the police officers, giving the man a piece of her mind. He was glad to see she wasn't in cuffs. He wondered what the police thought had been happening. They hadn't read him his rights, which meant he wasn't under arrest at this time. They were brought separately to the police station, each being questioned in small interrogation rooms. Jackson was asked for his computer password, which he readily supplied. He also gave Andrea as a reference, but it had a hard time making the officer understand that Andrea thought that Katie was indeed J.D. Emerson, 
even though Jackson was the one who wrote the books. Finally, Jackson decided he had cooperated enough and asked for a lawyer. You're not under arrest, Mr. Davis, the cop who had identified himself as Detective Olson told him. Then can I have the handcuffs removed? Jackson asked pointedly. Olson extracted a key and unlocked Jackson's hands. What is this really about? Jackson wanted to get to the bottom of this. He didn't like that Katie could be anywhere. He was supposed to be looking out for her. A case of mistaken identity. Detective Olson gave a grim smile. We have a man who's been stalking, drugging, and abducting women in the area. His general description fits you. The truck you drive is close to the make, model, and color that witnesses have described. The motel was believed to be in his hunting grounds, and we had set up a sting in hopes of catching him. When you came out of your vehicle, carrying the lady, we thought we had our man. Good grief. Jackson ran a hand through his hair. You thought I was going to kill Katie. I didn't say that, Olson responded. You can see why we treated you as we did. Miss Sutton has supported your story. With the evidence from your laptop and a call to Miss Schultz, you've been cleared. Jackson let out a heavy sigh of relief. He had no idea they had thought he was some psycho. He was glad no one had gotten hurt tonight. Can I go then? Absolutely, Olson nodded. He had a mischievous smile. As long as I can get an autograph from my wife, she's a big fan. Jackson blinked in surprise. Katie will have to sign. As far as the public is concerned, she's J.D. Olson agreed, and he led Jackson to where Katie was in the waiting area. Katie signed a few items for some of the staff, taking even a couple of selfies with them. Then they were given a lift back to the motel. Imagine, a male romance writer. Detective Olson shook his head as he let him out of the back seat. You folks have a good night. Thanks, Jackson said dryly. He unlocked his truck, taking their luggage out. So, you write romance and moonlight as a stalker of women? Katie eyed him as she teased. Not funny. Jackson looked at his watch. It's two in the morning and we need to get an early start. Katie grabbed the key from him and opened the door of the motel room. She took her suitcase from Jackson. Then I'd better get back to my beauty sleep. Thanks for all the excitement. Good night, Katie. Jackson folded his arms across his chest. Lock the door. If you hear anything odd, call me immediately. Katie rolled her eyes as she shut the door on him. I'm sure I'll be fine. Good night. Jackson still waited to hear the locks turn before he headed to his own room. Over the second day of traveling, he found out a couple of things about Katie. They were trying to reach the second booking on schedule, so they took turns driving. Since they had barely gotten any sleep in the motel, they took turns napping to catch up on their sleep. Katie snored softly when she slept. He learned how she drank her coffee. She was easy to talk to. After driving a tiny hatchback, she loved driving his truck. She had shot him the most amazing smile when she put it into drive. She filled out a pair of jeans really well. Jackson tried not to notice. She was in a relationship with someone else. She might be pregnant. It didn't stop him from looking, even as he admonished himself. He suspected that she liked working with kids since she worked at the daycare and was a leader for the local girls' group. What he hadn't known was how much she adored children and babies. When they stopped for a fast-food lunch, she chatted for nearly the entire time with the couple beside them who had twin toddlers. It was obvious that Katie was made to be a mother. She loved her small-town life and the country. Katie didn't want to move to a city to have to find a job. If sales went well, she wouldn't have to, Jackson decided. Pendle was losing enough people. They didn't need to lose Katie, too. He tried to work on rewriting his romance scenes throughout the day as Katie drove. They weren't going well. If anything, he felt his main characters were even more awkward than before. It wasn't long before he was frustrated enough to shut off the laptop and settle back to try to sleep. He drowsily watched Katie drive and decided she was right pretty. No, she was more than pretty. He closed his eyes and hoped that the father of the baby wasn't Trent. Jackson wasn't sure if he could handle his brother being involved with Katie, which was silly because he wasn't involved with Katie. 
They were just friends. Jackson clamped down firmly on the thoughts and did his best to sleep. He woke to the screeching of brakes, the cracking of the windshield, and being thrown against his seatbelt. Jackson grabbed the dash, bracing himself at the abrupt stop. Katie? He looked immediately at her, worried. She had the steering wheel in a death grip. He looked to see the windshield was still holding, but cracked everywhere. They were stopped on the highway, with cars zooming past at a high rate of speed. He leaned over and put a hand over hers. Let's pull off the road. Pale and shaking, she nodded. Together, they carefully maneuvered the truck to the shoulder and put it in park. Jackson switched on the hazard lights so other motorists would know they were stopped and to avoid them. Katie immediately burst into tears. Alarmed, Jackson undid both their seatbelts and pulled her into his arms for a hug. Are you hurt? What happened? I think I killed Bambi, she wailed into his shirt, and Jackson couldn't help but chuckle. He did his best to tamp down his laughter and sympathy to her distress. Jackson rubbed her back and observed that the rest of traffic seemed to be proceeding normally now that they were out of the way. A man knocked on the driver's window, and Jackson opened it partway. You folks okay? the concerned stranger asked. She's a bit shaken, but we're okay, Jackson assured him. That's a fine deer you hit back there. You and your wife want it? he inquired. Jackson noted the man's camo. It's all yours if you like. Sweet, he grinned. If you want to lift to town, I can drive you. Thanks, but I'll just call for a tow, Jackson easily replied. The man gave them a nod and called for his buddy to help him with the deer with a thumbs up. They're going to eat Bambi. Katie looked up at him with tears in her eyes, her lips trembling. Jackson swallowed hard and ignored the sucker punch that those brown eyes delivered. It's not Bambi. It's Bambi's cousin Roger, who's a mean old buck and deserves to feed some poor family with kids who need some freezer meat. I know that's not true, she sniffed and rested her head on his chest again, but it makes me feel better. Thank you. You're welcome, he said gruffly, and rested his chin on her head. He felt a grip of protectiveness for Katie. If the baby's father didn't do right by her, maybe he should. Whoa, wait just a minute, he thought to himself. He had no intention of getting married just yet. Where were these thoughts coming from? He concluded it was Katie. She was a hot mess that would make any man either run or try to protect her in every way possible. It didn't mean that he should be donning a tie in front of a preacher. Once they were done this book tour and things were back to normal, surely this urge would pass. Jackson took a deep breath and called for a tow as he continued to hold Katie with one arm. They needed to get the truck repaired or have a rental as quick as possible for more than one reason. Not only did they have to get to the book tour, but Jackson didn't like the feelings that Katie was stirring up. He reminded himself that she was likely taken and he had no right to start thinking about her romantically. There was some damage to the hood as well, so Jackson left the truck with a body shop who promised good results and got a rental. The rest of the journey was uneventful, and they barely made it on time to the second scheduled book tour event at a large bookstore. Remember, you are J.D., Jackson reminded Katie as he opened the door to the bookstore for her. Right, she said a little breathlessly. Whether it was from the brisk pace they had covered the parking lot in, or from the terror slowly gripping her, Katie didn't know. It had been an awful afternoon, and she wasn't ready for this. One of the attendants pointed them to a bunch of chairs, which were largely already filled, with more women milling about, holding onto books to be signed by J.D. Emerson. Jackson pointed out Andrea Schultz. While they had never met in person, he had seen her picture online. That's Andrea. She'll give you a breakdown on what to expect. You can do this. Katie had a nervous nod. She hadn't had any time to do her makeup or change her clothes. She was scared spitless. She stretched her mouth into something that might resemble a smile and approached Andrea. Hi, Andrea? Andrea was a leggy brunette in a business attire. She looked Katie up and down with a bit of distaste for Katie's casual clothes. Do I know you? J.D. Emerson, Katie lied bracing herself while keeping a smile in place. She fully expected Andrea to cry out that she was a fraud at any moment. 
She put out her hand in greeting, and after a pause of surprise, Andrea briskly took it. "'You're not what I expected,' Andrea said critically as she pursed her lips in disapproval. "'However, this could work. The wholesome farm girl thing could help your image.' Katie blinked. She had borrowed a pullover from Jackson when she managed to spill coffee on her entire suitcase of clothes yesterday. They hadn't had time to stop to do laundry. Katie looked down and realized the gray, too-big shirt had a tractor on it. Now, we'll go over your image, makeup, and wardrobe later, but for now, you need to get this particular event started. Andrea shoved a book in Katie's hands. I will introduce you. You say a little about yourself, why you became a writer, and that sort of thing. Then read a chapter. Answer some questions without giving away too much of the next book you're writing. Then sign people's books and let them take some selfies with you. That's it. Katie nodded uncertainly. She wished Andrea had slowed down in her explanation, or at least given Katie a list. It was too much to absorb all at once, especially when Katie was so anxious. The next thing she knew, Andrea had a hand on her back and was propelling her in front of the crowd. Hi, everyone, this is J.D. Emerson. Let's give her a round of applause for leaving her busy life and giving us a little of her time. Katie felt like a deer in the headlights as everyone clapped, and the seats filled up. With a nervous giggle, Katie felt that was a bad analogy for today, considering what had happened to the deer. Andrea gave her a little shove so that she was front and center. Katie swallowed hard as the applause died down, and dozens of women waited patiently for her to say something. She looked at the back of the crowd to see Jackson. He gave her a tight smile and a thumbs up. Katie nodded and looked at the book in her hands before giving the group a tremulous smile. Maybe if she stared at the book the whole time, she could pretend there wasn't anyone sitting in the chairs. Good afternoon. My name is J.D. Emerson, and I'm not particularly interesting. I live in a small rural town that is getting smaller. Recently, I was made redundant at my job at the local daycare. Fortunately, I have been writing. As you all know, I have written a lot of books— I don't always remember all the nuances of what I wrote, so please be kind with your questions. Katie gestured to the back of the room, and the woman swiveled to have a look. I came with my friend Jackson, who is supporting me because I'm afraid to speak in front of crowds. At my grade nine play, I froze on the stage, and they had to get a couple of teachers to carry me off. She had another nervous laugh. It bubbled out of her, and Katie took a moment to clear her throat and tamp it down. If she continued... She would just break out in giggles and not speak coherently for the rest of the evening. Enough about me. I'm supposed to read a chapter, and then we can have some questions and answers. Katie fumbled with the book, dropping it. Her face flushed, and she quickly scooped the book back up. Opening it, Katie realized it was upside down. Putting the book upright, she began to haltingly read. It took a page before her voice became smoother and stronger. By the end of the chapter, she was much more comfortable. Then again, reading was easy. She could ignore the room and pretend to be back in high school, called on by the teacher to read a couple of pages. That wasn't particularly scary. When it came time to answer questions, Katie did fairly well. Only once or twice did she look at Jackson for a nearly imperceptible nod or a negative shake of the head. When one lady boldly asked if Jackson was available, and if she could have his number, as she turned and winked at him, Katie neatly jumped on that one by saying he wasn't available with a stilted smile. Suddenly, she was glad Jackson had asked her to be J.D. Who knows how many women would be chasing him if they knew he was the up-and-coming author? Katie dreaded the thought, and decided being a buffer between him and the ladies was a fine idea. She continued to answer questions, gaining a little confidence. While it might help in sales, this was also part of the reason Jackson didn't want to publicly reveal he was J.D. Emerson, he wryly thought to himself. He had no desire for the fame that would attach itself to him if he was revealed as the author. Jackson was glad that Katie had said he wasn't available. He had no desire for one-night stands or the particular ladies who enjoyed them. He watched as a nervous Katie shone through signing books and granting selfies with the fans. Jackson was proud of her. She was doing something difficult for her and handling the situation gracefully. Andrea came to stand beside him, 
handing Jackson his and Katie's passes for the next section of the book tour. Too bad, Andrea murmured as she looked him over, liking what she saw, even if he was a little rough looking around the edges in his farm boy attire. Jackson had the feeling she was the type of woman who ate a man for breakfast, then dropped him faster than a rotting fish. He had no desire to be her next meal. She's doing pretty good. Good? Andrea snorted in disbelief. You call that good? She was terrible. She's terrified of public speaking, Jackson replied evenly. He was starting to like Andrea less and less. He really didn't like the way she talked about Katie. Cut her some slack. She needs to get better, especially before the television spot. Andrea shook her head. She eyed Katie critically, not liking what she saw, from the hair and the makeup to the clothes and worn sneakers. Her image, her little speech, her interaction with the fans. It all needs a drastic intervention. We only get one chance to make a first impression, and she needs to shine. We can coach her. Jackson frowned. He didn't like the idea of changing Katie. She was fine the way she was. She just needs some practice. She needs a lot more than that. Andrea wrote down an address in a little book and ripped out the page, handing it to Jackson. Get her here by eight tomorrow morning. She's getting a makeover. Jackson reluctantly took the paper. She's okay the way she is. If she were to be some farmer's wife, maybe. However, Andrea's eyes gleamed as she replied, I am going to make her a star. Jackson looked at Katie as she smiled and signed another book. With some trepidation, he wondered what he had done. Katie almost signed the first few books in her own name. She had even gotten as far as the K in a big, bold way. She managed to switch it into the name of one fan, and the rest she wrote, Kudos, J.D. Katie cringed at the thought. It was tacky, but at least she had covered up her mistake. Finally done with the last person, Katie massaged her cramped hand and wandered over to Jackson. What did you think? Will I do? I think you did great, Jackson smiled at her, wanting to bolster her courage. Everyone seemed happy with meeting you and having their books signed. Katie gave him a smile of relief. It was a start, Andrea announced as she came to stand beside them. It's unfortunate that I didn't get much time to prepare for you for this as you could use the coaching. However, now that you're here, I will get you polished and newspaper-worthy. Newspaper? Katie asked with a bit of alarm. Yes. Andrea checked her watch. You have interviews with a couple of newspapers, influencers, bloggers, and magazines. We're going to make a big publicity splash. I don't think I'm ready for this, Katie said faintly. You will do fine, Jackson tried to assure her. Wondering why Andrea couldn't pick up on the fact that Katie was nervous enough without adding more stress. Nonsense, Andrea sharply remonstrated Katie. Tomorrow you'll be made over and afterward I will whip you into shape for the interviews. There's nothing to worry about once I have prepared you. Katie gave Andrea a disbelieving look. She felt trapped and a little scared of the agent. What Andrea means is that we will help you. Jackson put a hand on Katie's back. It's late, and you should get some beauty sleep. We have a busy day tomorrow. Andrea tutted and pointed a finger at Jackson. I'm counting on you to get her to the spa on time. Jackson gave a reluctant nod, and a satisfied Andrea walked away. Spa? Katie looked at him questioningly. She said something about having a new hairstyle and some clothes. Jackson frowned. He didn't like Andrea's high-handedness about the situation. She hadn't even asked Katie if she wanted to change her image. I guess they might cut your hair. I like my hair the way it is. Katie ran a hand through her glossy dark mane, taking a few tresses in her hand and looking at them. What's wrong with my hair? Nothing, Jackson affirmed. She had pretty hair. Even if she had it in a ponytail much of the time, when it was loose it looked very silky soft. If you don't want to change it, you don't have to. Her gaze was troubled as she thought about it. We can see what they recommend, I suppose, before I decide. Katie, you're fine the way that you are. Don't let Andrea bully you into anything, Jackson advised gruffly. I'm more worried about messing up in an interview with these reporters, bloggers, and whoever else she said was going to ask questions, Katie confessed uneasily. I don't know the first thing about writing a book. 
Why don't we go to the hotel and we can go over that, Jackson offered. I will let you know anything we think might matter. We can also ask Andrea tomorrow what questions might be asked. Then we can figure out the answers before the interviews. Katie nodded. That sounds good. He escorted her back to the rental truck, opening the door for her and helping her in. At the hotel, Jackson brought in their bags and they waited at the lobby desk. It's fancy, Katie commented at the decor. It was far above the old motel in Pendle that had closed down years ago due to lack of business. This place had a chandelier over a seating area. May I help you? The desk clerk asked as he returned from an office next to the desk area. We have a reservation. Jackson provided the printed-out email that Andrea had sent him. It showed the reservation number on it. With a smile, the clerk keyed in the information into his computer. Room 112. Let me just get your key. Excuse me? Isn't there two rooms? Jackson frowned. The clerk looked from the computer to Jackson. No, just the one room. How much is it for a second room? asked Jackson. For some reason, he had expected Andrea to book them two rooms after she had learned that both of them would be going on the tour. Apparently, the detail had slipped her mind. The clerk named an amount that had Katie gasping. That's over half my month's rent! We are a five-star hotel, the clerk explained patiently, looking at their clothes and appearance. It was obvious he didn't think they would fit in with the regular clientele. A second room is not an option. I'm sorry to say that we have no vacancies due to the conference series being held in our hotel. I can recommend another hotel if you'd like. No, thank you. Katie put a hand on Jackson's arm. She knew that money was always tight and didn't see the point of spending so much for just one night in a bed. Jackson can room with me. Does the room have two beds? If not, can we get a second one? The clerk checked the screen of the computer for information. Two queen beds. See? Problem solved, Katie declared. Are you sure? A concern Jackson asked. If word of this ever got out back home, Katie's reputation would take a bit of a hit. Not that they were going to do anything, Jackson knew. But some people tended to gossip, and small-town values tended to be old values. It's fine, Katie assured him. Besides, you can't answer all of my questions if you're in another hotel. Jackson nodded, agreeing with that. He wished he had thought of telling her about being a writer during the long drive here. It would have been a good use of their time, but he hadn't known about the interviews. It seemed like Andrea was constantly adding to her demanding tour. We'll take the room. The clerk had them sign some paperwork, gave them a map of the hotel, detailing the amenities, and gave them their room key. Within minutes, they entered the luxurious room, looking around. Wow, Katie ran her hand over a bedspread. Do you think Miss Schultz is going to put us up in other hotels like this one during the tour? Your publisher must be certain you're going to make a lot of sales if they're going to invest in you like this. The books do seem to be popular, agreed Jackson. If his monthly royalty checks were anything to go by, his readership was steadily increasing. Usually Jackson skimmed over those parts of the emails that Andrea sent. He was too busy farming and writing to get it too in-depth with minute details. Jackson set his overnight bag on a bed and put her suitcase onto her bed. He wasn't sure how he felt about sharing a room with Katie. If he was going to be booking his own accommodations over the duration of the tour, it could be pretty pricey. Jackson would have to send an email to Andrea to find out what she intended to do. He had the feeling that the publishing house would likely only cover one room. Do you think they have a laundry service? Or machines that I could use? Katie asked uncertainly, looking through her coffee-stained clothes in her suitcase. The clerk didn't mention it. Jackson frowned. He wasn't sure why Andrea was all fired up to change Katie. She was pretty enough. Jackson had been noticing that too much lately. I can call the front desk and find out. Pressing zero on the phone, Jackson asked the clerk. He says they offer a dry-cleaning service. Katie wrinkled her nose. I've never dry-cleaned anything in my life. Will it get coffee stains out of regular clothes? He's not certain, sighed Jackson. He wondered why such a fancy hotel didn't have a simple washer and dryer set. He says he can't make any claims as to what the dry-cleaners can do since they're in an outside service. 
It wouldn't be back in time for tomorrow morning anyways. Then there's no point. Katie put her clothes back in the suitcase. Jackson listened to the clerk on the line. Glancing at Katie, he raised an eyebrow. They have a gift shop that's still open. There might be some clothing there. Let's try the gift shop, she readily agreed. Minutes later, looking at price tags, Katie regretted coming to the gift shop. She could get five shirts out of a big box store for the price of one here. Possibly eight shirts out of the thrift shop. Just because the shirts had the city name or the hotel name on them didn't mean that they were worth this much money. A pretty bathing suit caught her eye. They have a pool here. Jackson saw Katie looking at the bathing suit. Everything is so expensive, Katie told him with regret, letting go of the fabric. Think of it as your souvenirs from the trip, he responded. You need a shirt at the very least. If you didn't bring a bathing suit, you should get one because we'll be staying at a lot of hotels with pools. There's no reason we can't enjoy them. Are you sure? She eyed the bathing suits again. Right underneath that one piece was the sweetest bikini she had seen in a long time. Jackson took her hand, putting his credit card in it. I'm going to get changed into my suit and I'll meet you at the pool. Get whatever you need. Katie looked at the credit card in surprise. She opened her mouth to object, but Jackson was gone, walking out of the gift shop. She snapped her mouth shut. Katie decided that if he was going to trust her with his credit card, then she would pick up just the necessities. An hour later, Katie came out of the shop with three bags and a receipt that had been shocking. She truly hoped that Jackson wouldn't be mad, but it was too late now. Since she didn't know when she would be able to get her laundry done, Katie had decided to purchase two complete outfits. She did buy the bikini. Then she got flip-flops because it just seemed silly to walk down to the pool in her sneakers. The clerk had helpfully pointed out that because she had bought a bathing suit, the wraps were at a discount. Then again, Katie wasn't sure that each hotel they visited would have a rope, and she would feel odd walking the halls from her room to the pool in just her bikini with anyone able to see her. So she bought the wrap. And sunglasses. A book for the times where Jackson was writing and she was bored, a razor for her legs, shaving cream, moisturizer, clean underwear, and a chocolate bar for her frayed nerves, then acne cream to prevent the pimple that would occur from eating the chocolate. A half hour later, she shaved, moisturized, and debated the wisdom of a bikini versus a one-piece suit in the mirror, because was she really that pale? Her skin hadn't looked that bad in change rooms at the shop. Frowning, she tied the wrap around her waist, grabbing the map of the hotel, and headed for the pool. She grabbed a towel from a stack, popping it onto a lounge chair before looking for Jackson. Katie spotted him in the hot tub, eyes closed, leaning back and enjoying the heat. Taking a deep breath, Katie walked toward him. She had been swimming with Trent, Stacy, and Jackson multiple times. She had seen Jackson in his swim trunks before. This was nothing new, Katie reminded herself. Nothing to get worried, nervous, or excited about, Katie told her hormones. She undid the wrap with a little laugh. I bet you thought I got lost. He had been wrong, Jackson decided as he opened his eyes to see Katie not in the one-piece suit she had been fingering, but a silky-looking bikini. Katie wasn't pretty. She was beautiful. He acknowledged with a sucker punch to the gut. And Jackson was in trouble. He swallowed hard. I did wonder. I'm sorry, but I bought a couple of extra things. Katie confessed as she stepped into the hot tub. Oh, this is glorious. Suddenly, Jackson was thinking of Katie in that bikini in a brand new hot tub on the back deck of the farmhouse. He idly wondered if the deck could hold the weight or if he would have to shore it up. Jackson shook himself mentally. What was he thinking? This was Katie. She happily relaxed, sitting in the water as the jets buffeted them. With a sigh, she opened her eyes and got down to business. Tell me everything there is to being a writer, she demanded. She was going to be ready for tomorrow, Katie vowed. Thank you for listening. Did you know that currently I have my ebook, A Ring for Christmas, on the U.S. Amazon site for free? You can purchase it at no cost to you. Happy reading and happy listening.